where you know the title for today, which uh, is taken from the book of Jeremiah. So we'll begin there. And the I'm just going to talk around the subject of what God is working in our day. So, again, I've said it to you before, but if I use an English word that someone doesn't understand, stick your hand up, because I'm on the gallery, so I can see you, because I know that sometimes I use an English word that is not familiar. Um, so if anyone, if I use a word that... Um, occasionally I get emails from people complaining we're well, not complaining, but just pointing out that uh, your English is a little bit too complex for, uh, you know, Manglish, those who speak Manglish and uh, Malaysian English, <laughs> sometimes known as Manglish. <laughs> and, um, but anyway, it's all right. It's Malaysians who told me we speak Manglish. So I'm not being <laughs> unpleasant at all. And um, amen. Anyway, this little bit like Australian in, in English is a bit different from English English. And Irish English is different to English English. And American English is, you know, and it goes on and on and on. All the English is different. But there you are. So the the initial scripture that I took the title from is found in Jeremiah 18, where we find the Lord is wanting to speak to his prophet. And his prophet is a key man uh, to what is happening. There needs to be a voice in the midst of what's happening among the people of God, the Old Testament people of God, when the empires are rising round about, Assyria has risen and passed away, and uh, the empire of Babylon is descending and has been around, all, already taking hold of nations round about, and God doesn't leave himself without witness. Already, some of the people of God are taken away captive by the, four, by, by the Babylonians, and they're in Babylon already. How long should they stay there? What's happening? Um, and God needs to have voices and among the voices, probably you will know that there were other prophets prophesying, including Ezekiel, who was among those already in Babylon. And young men like Daniel, he was being taken away along with uh, his friends, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, these were men uh, of God, and along with them, there were women of God. There were the true people of God mixed among the, the people who should have been the people of God, Israel, the failed Israel, the Israel of disobedience, the Israel of idolatry, um, and God is so that they've been caught up, the remnant, as they're called in the scripture, the remnant that the Lord always has, according to faith. He's always had them. So the remnant, according to faith, are caught up in the midst of circumstances that are far larger than them. What dost thou work, O God? What are you doing? And we could ask these sorts of questions, and I'm going to touch on what God is doing in the church, 
the people of God, the true people of God in our day, what is God doing with the nations and the empires? I'm just going to touch on it. What is God doing with what is nowadays called Israel at the eastern end of the Mediterranean? So I'm wanting to look just touching on from the scripture what God is working as far as I understand it in, in our day. Simple things, in fact, I'm not going to go into great depth, but we have to have that true prophetic voice that is discerning what is God working. The first thing to establish is coming to Jeremiah 18, the word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, arise and go down uh, to the potter's house and there I will cause thee to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house uh, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. Now, did you notice the word wheels in plural? It's in the plural. By the days of Jeremiah and for about 1500 years before that, originally the potters made ceramics, they made pottery, they did not use a wheel, they used to get the clay and make it like into a shoelace and then they would wind it together and so make a pot and bake the pot. By the time of uh, a few hundred years later, they began to use one wheel that they made an effort to spin. And then by the days of Jeremiah, there were two wheels, one which was out of sight, usually made of stone, which the potter turned with his feet and the other wheel was affixed with uh, above and would spin at a different pace. Sometimes it was made of stone, sometimes it was made of wood, and it is on that one which was visible to the sight that he was working his work. And the motion of the wheel was under the complete control of the potter. And that wheel was underneath, as I say, generally out of sight. He was spinning it with his feet, the pace that he knew best for the forming of the vessel. This is what Jeremiah would have seen. And uh, the, it says, he wrought a work on the wheels. Now, that word wheels, if I may point this out to you, is a rare word in the, the Old Testament. And you, you will find this word in the book of Exodus. And it's a strange link. And I will just read it to you in the book of Exodus, where... It refers to the Hebrew midwives. And it, it's chapter one. And these midwives were hauled over the coals because of the birthing that was going on. People were being birthed. Children were being birthed. The command had come to annihilate the men, children. <clears throat> but these women, two midwives, probably leading up a group of midwives, they said, you know, when the king of Egypt, I mean, Exodus chapter one, 
Verse 17, but the midwives feared God and did not as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the men, children, the boys alive. And the king of Egypt called for the midwives and said unto them, Why have ye done this thing and have saved the men, child, children alive? And the midwives said unto Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are lively and are delivered ere the midwives come in unto them. Therefore God dealt well with the midwives, and people multiplied and waxed very mighty. It's, it's quite amazing, because right embedded there, these, the word for the way that they were lively, as it says, is the word on the stools. And that word stools, it's, it might sound strange to us that the in those days the Hebrew women brought forth their children sitting on a stool of wheels. It's a remarkable thing. So they could swing around in, in their travail, you understand, get some sort of relief. And they could move uh, easily to relieve somewhat of their labor pains and their contractions. And so they bring, bring for, brought forth children on the wheels. It's the same word as the potter's wheels. Quite remarkable. So we must understand that this use of the wheels is... Uh, God is saying something to us. I am bringing forth my purpose in the midst of all that is happening. So these Hebrew women brought forth further children, uh, men children, women girl children, brought them forth in the face of the enemy. And we need to get this clear that God was birthing new life spiritually in the presence of the enemy. Are you understanding? As circumstances are spinning around us, like the wheel, but the wheel is controlled by God, the pace of the happenings. If we want to apply it, and we should to our day prophetically, the rise of nations, the rise of the anger of men and women, the European Union, the decline of the United States, the compromised state of Canada's that is by far in front of compromise. You understand moral compromise, spiritual compromise. New Zealand is similar to Canada in that regard, morally compromised. Then you think of the Muslim uh, rise of Islam. It's it, the way it is coming into the West here in Dublin, the influence in England, the, the mosques, the changes, the vain attempts of men in government. Then you think of Russia, Ukraine, and the madness of dictators the influence of Putin, and so on and so on, the rise of, of, of the efforts of men. Then you think of technology, <clears throat> you know, you, you think of AI, 
Uh, you may know that one of the most brilliant men in the AI world has been sacked. One wonders what's going on in Silicon Valley. You know, there's so much happening, but we need to keep in mind that underneath the wheel where the clay is laying upon and the molding of the people of God is taking place, God is spinning the wheel and is in full control of its pace. Now, this is the first prophetic sight that I want to emphasize, and I believe God wants to say to us, hallelujah, that the Lord is working a work in our day, and he is in control and sets the boundaries around the empires. And this is what's going to come through. Verse 5, as, as Jeremiah, back in Jeremiah 18, uh, verse 5, then the word of the Lord came to me saying, so he's looking at the wheel and he's looking at what the potter is doing. And the pot, what had happened, verse 4, was <coughs> that the vessel he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter, so he made it again uh, into another vessel as seemed good to the potter to make it. It was marred in his hand. Now, this is actually a very pertinent word to share with you at this point, because many a Christian has been a work on God's wheel, and there has been a marring. Now, one of the major causes for marring in uh, the potter's hand, uh, uh, I'm speaking naturally now, is number one, there are, are air pockets in the clay that impede the true molding. Number two, there are lumps of clay that are hard so that as the potter seeps to shape and work, the, the, the vessel is marred, and I realize that as I move around uh, among brothers and sisters and a meeting people, so many are talking to me about things that were like air pockets in their lives, the way they dealt with their families, the way that this happened, the way that they idolized their careers, and so on, and they realize that they are a marred vessel. But it's so encouraging to know that they were marred in the hands of the Lord. Sometimes there were hard lumps in their life that they would not yield to the Lord in. They made choices. They look back and they realize they've gone astray. And yet, and some of them have gone down into a place of, of just disillusionment, disappointment. They may have been in churches where, for whatever reasons, the vessel of that local church was messed up and damaged by some air pocket in the leadership. So you understanding my picture? because this is important that we grasp, you know, where there was pride of face and pride of grace in the leadership. They wouldn't listen. They wouldn't humble themselves. Some great hard lump. And so the church went pear-shaped, as they say. And there were splits and breakups and all the rest of it. Let's get it clear in our hearts that God is working a work. It's in his hands. The church is in his hands. The people of God are in his hands. You and I are in his hands. And uh, he made it again. That's what he's doing. 
This is one of the works that he is doing in our day. This is particularly relevant to those places in the world where the church had its, well, its life in the 18th century, 19th century, 20th century in the Western countries. You're understanding me. And uh, it's, it's messed up, my brethren and sisters. It's messed up. Uh, you don't look to the United States to lead you and the United States church to lead you into great heights. Now, this that I'm saying is not quite so relevant for, for say, Malaysia and uh, other countries, Asia, South America, Africa. The, 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 the Lord is working with his clay there. And perhaps there in those countries where God is working, you have to make sure that the air pockets that will mar and the hard lumps that would mar uh, are, are being removed so that you don't suffer. So God is working a work in our day. And this is how it says, the word of the Lord came to me, verse 5, saying, O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord. Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in mine hand, O house of Israel. At what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up, to pull down, to destroy it. If that nation against whom I pronounced turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. And at what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plant it, if it do evil in my sight, that it obey not my voice, then I will repent of the good. I will repent of the good wherewith I said I would benefit them. Now, therefore, go to speak to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Thus saith the Lord, behold, I frame evil against you and devise a device against you. Return ye now everyone from his evil way and make your ways and your doings good. It's, it's amazing. There's so much here that is relevant to our day, where God is giving to his prophet prophetic insight to the fact, and we need to hear this, that you can't rely. So if I say something about the nation of Israel now, I said I would comment on what is God doing? at the eastern end of the Mediterranean. I'll just make a comment to you. You know, of course, that God has changed things according to his purpose or appears to have changed things. Now, if I was to say to you that God has never dealt with anyone according to race, but according to faith. Always he has called people according, and as they have believed him according to faith, so that 
that great father of us all named Abraham, separated unto God, believed God, and it was accounted to him as righteousness. So, you know that the Lord led Isaac, his son, into faith. You know that the Lord led his grandson, Jacob, through all kinds of things into faith. And they believed God, and they loved God, and they came through all kinds of marring things. And then there was Joseph, and then there's the rescue from, and the deliverance and redemption from Egypt. And in time, the bringing into the promised land. And all the way through, there were those who loved God, what they called the remnant according to faith, according to faith, according to faith. The faith that all the nations should have had, but the faith, the confidence in God, the hope in God, the trust in God, the love of God, where they became a people who were relying on their race, relying on promises that God had made according to, and they were relying on them, thinking that it, the Lord can never destroy us. We, he's made all these promises. He's, uh, you know, the land is ours. Uh, so that even in the day of Jeremiah, as Nebuchadnezzar is gathering around, there are false prophets prophesying, oh, he'll go home. Jerusalem will not fall. You know, they, it will not happen. And there's this lovely voice, this lone voice, this, this voice from God, Jeremiah said, oh, no, oh, no going to go into captivity. Jerusalem's going to be raised down to the ground. You can't rely on the fact that, you know, if that nation, verse 10, do evil in my sight, that it obey not my, my voice, then I will repent of the good. Wherewith I said I would benefit them. Go and tell them that. Go and tell them that. Go and tell them that. Isn't that a serious thing? You see, but all the way through, and this is such a beauty, my brethren and sisters, we should rejoice in this. Oh, the beauty of the remnant according to faith that was ever present. So you think of Daniel. You think of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You think of Jeremiah. You think of the multitudes of ladies. Multitudes of faithful ladies who brought forth children. And they didn't bring them forth according to race. They brought them forth according to faith with this great hope in their heart. Perhaps this one. This son of mine will be the redeemer and the saviour of all the people. And the prophets prophesied of this. They prophesied of, uh, of the nation. They prophesied wider than that. Go and speak to the isles. Go and speak to the nations. You know, the, the, there was always in the background of all, and well, actually, in some ways, the foreground. Ground. Take a prophetic psalm like this. It's, it's a famous psalm, and I'll just read a little bit about it, where, again, it's all to do with the heathen raging 
and the people imagining vain things and the kings of the earth and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and his Christ is anointed. And you know, the Lord sits in the heavens. I've set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Kiss the sun, my son. And you know who the sun is, don't you? The sun that came from the womb of Mary. You know who Mary was, don't you? The greatest woman that ever lived. The woman who was according to faith, who realized among with multitudes of them called the remnant through the years, who knew their chief role was to bring forth the son who would be the redeemer of the world. God always had the world in mind. God always had the nations in mind, not just one nation. And this remnant that always was according to faith, then this phrase you can read in those chapters in the book of Romans, this remnant according to faith, Part of their faith was, we exist to be the channel through whom the Messiah comes. The Messiah of the nations. First the Messiah of our nation, then the Messiah of the world. Hallelujah. And this is why, dear Mary, you know, one of the remnant, according to faith, she thrilled when she heard and she knew. And in her measure, she understood. She understood. Praise the Lord. And Jesus came. And straight away, the remnant, according to faith, in Embodied in Zechariah, father of John Baptist, embodied in Simeon. You check up their prophecies. They talked about this little baby being the savior of the world. Hallelujah. It's always there, my brethren. I'll say no more about it, but... They brought forth, they brought forth the Son of God, the Son of Man, the Savior of the world. Hallelujah. And he came to his own first. And his own received him not, John's Gospel, chapter 1. But as many as received him, to them, you know, there were always those that received him. You know, the remnant according to faith from the Jewish nation. And these are very wonderful things to contemplate. And when I come up to these days, you know, God's people are people according to faith, not according to race. So that one by one, by one, by one, those from the Jewish race have been coming to faith in their Redeemer. And yet, and you might wonder what is happening in our day, and yet there are those who are godless. And there is those who take pride in race. They take pride in race. We are the people. We are the people. We are the people. And you know that before ever there is a work of the Spirit, there is the work of the flesh. 
Before there is the man of the spirit, there is the man of the flesh. You know that is an unchanging law in the heart of God. You know that first Adam and Adam fell and then the last Adam came to the fight and he fulfilled all that the first Adam failed to do. And so the arm of the flesh rises in its pride of race and says, we are the men, we are the ones. We have these rights. We have these promises. And they endeavor with the power of the flesh to accomplish things. They take the sword. They take the sword. They do not look away unto the God who made them. And they, with the arm of the flesh, seek to protect themselves <clears throat> and uh, make themselves a people. And God says, the arm of the flesh will fail you. Trust not in horses. And these things are prophetically shared in the Old Testament. Trust not in horses and so on. And so in our day, we are seeing the efforts of those who are taking pride in race. And we shall watch them intensify. And enemies shall gather round about them. And their strength shall fail. And in my understanding, the Lord will begin to make himself known to them. And they will begin to turn, perhaps in hundreds, perhaps in thousands, and look upon him whom they have pierced. And they will become, in their generation, People who live in the life of the vine, <laughs> crafted in again. I don't want to say any more about it, but I've said enough to get you to thinking from another perspective, a larger perspective, that this is something of that is happening in our day. So that you can, you can watch and you will see, for you understand that out of all proportion to their number, they are brilliant. They exceed in the number of geniuses that they have produced. You know why that is, don't you? Because even yet, when God said, I'll make you the head and not the tail, even yet, still, in their genetic pool, if we might put it that way, they carry genius and skill and wisdom. Uh, in, in the sense of knowledge, I should say, not so much wisdom. But they exercise it with the arm of the flesh. And some of us Christians might seek to justify them, but we should not. For the kingdom of the Son, the Son of God, is not the kingdom that takes up the sword to extend itself. Put your sword away, Peter. Let me heal the, heal the ear of him who you've locked it off and impaired his hearing. There are many things I could say, for I have researched long on these matters and have had no occasion to change my view in more than 50 years. And my understanding of these things 
that I'm saying to you now, though I don't think I've ever said publicly before. But you know that the nation shall be gathered around. And it will be Jesus who will save. And some will turn. And that's perhaps in days quite near at hand to come. And so God is working a work on his wheel with Israel, bringing them to nothing. Like he brought you to nothing. I'm right, aren't I? Where you found him when you were brought to nothing. When all your strength had failed and all your brilliance had failed and you came in to his blessed family, not on the basis of race or how many degrees you've got, you know, I've got a doctorate in ministry, I've got a doctorate in philosophy. I've got a doctorate in theology. Not on these grounds at all. Not on the grounds that I'm Malaysian, Chinese. Not on the grounds that I'm American. Not on the grounds that I'm Russian. You know, not on the grounds that I can trace my lineage back to the tribe of Benjamin. Paul called it awful in Philippians 2. That his line and lineage, he said, oh, I count all that but dung that I might win Christ. No pride of race. You and I come in on that ground that's the ground to which he will bring everyone, including that nation that prides on race. Understand the underlying principles of the ways of God that alter not for anyone. And so God is working this work on his wheel. He's allowing them to seek to establish a great kingdom with the arm of the flesh. He's seeking to help, to allow them to do that, that they might find. It's only, you know, in Christ alone, I put my trust. You know that song, in Christ alone. That's where we all come. That's where they will come. And God is working these things in our day on his wheel. And if I turn away from thinking of that nation, and if I turn away from that, and I turn to think of the nations in general, oh, the pride of man. You know, I turn you into Matthew 13. I don't know whether I've spoken uh, on this verse before, but let's concentrate a little on the nations. Um, on the nations. Matthew 13, where the Lord Jesus tells this small parable. And you all know it very well. Very well. It's concerning the, the wheat and the tears and uh, you know it, it says this let's just read down there's Jesus is interpreting the parable so I'm in Matthew and I'm in the 13th chapter and <clears throat> It says this, verse 24, another parable, this is Matthew 13, 24, put he forth unto them, saying, the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man 
which sowed good seed in his field. In his field. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And he sowed the good seed in his field. Amen. Keep that prophetically in mind. It's all his. Every yard of it, every meter of it, every square meter, every continent, every part, it's his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. And you can think of this if you want to go right back to Adam and the garden. While that man slept, that Adam man, that enemy came into God's field, into God's garden, and sowed a seed while Adam slept. Silly Adam who did not keep his role. An enemy came, the dragon, the serpent, the Satan, and sowed, and it's been in the world ever since. Amazing. Amazing. I could develop this along a number of lines. I'll just confine myself to this thought where... You know, God has sown such a seed in Adam's heart, hadn't he? Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, rule over it, be kings, be priests, minister to your wife. Lead her into the truth. Help her to understand. You're the king. You're made in my image. To be the head and not the tail. To rule. To never die. Amazing. This good seed that God sowed. And then the enemy comes doesn't he and says you become independent from god and you'll be gods whereas god said abide in me and you'll become like me you'll become a god a true god because you're one with me in fellowship with me and your godness will come forth because I will communicate to you my nature, my life, and my bounty, and my goodness, and my very self I will give to you. And through that, you will become such a God. <laughs> if I may put it this way, and please don't um, use this to misinterpret me, I don't think you will, but you'll almost become like false members of the Trinity. <laughs> of course you won't exactly be, but you're in fellowship, you will be. And you will share our eternal life and you will live forever and you will rule over universes, possibly universes that I will yet create. For I am God. And uh, from this state, man fell because the serpent came and he said, you shall be as gods, get independent from God. You know, do it yourself. You become wise, eat the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so the enemy came and sowed false seeds in the ground and you know what happens you know while men slept 
that it was growing. <clears throat> Verse 26 says that when the blade was sprung up, and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said to him, Sir, didst thou not sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? And he said unto them, An enemy has done this. An enemy has done this. He knew. The servant said to him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while you gather up the tares, you root up also the wheat with them. Let them both grow together under harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather ye first together the tares and bind them in bundles. Nothing individual there. Just bind them up in bundles. Gather the tares. Bind them up in bundles. burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Amen. You get the picture, don't you? You understand what's happening in our day with the nations, with the pride of man, with the political expertise, with the technological expertise, with the economic expertise, with the attempts at globalism, which are destined to fail, that will lead to the, the emergence of either an individual man known as the like Christ, the peace bringer, who will temporarily seek seem to bring some kind of unity among all these discordant nations and make music out of what is discord. He will seem to be successful. He will seek to, he will seem to be an incarnation of Satan manifesting not rank wickedness but subtleties such as we have not known and will seek to mesmerize and capture the nations and bring unity and all of this will go on whilst the true seed is still there in the field coming to its full fruit and the lord says and and when my word comes, everything must come to harvest, you see. Communism must come to its harvest. What's the harvest of communism in Cuba? It's almost been running, still running. What's the, what's the harvest of socialism in Myanmar? What is the harvest? of communism in China in its vain efforts to somehow uh, mix it with the entrepreneurial uh, skills of money-making and imperialism. What is the harvest there? It's all coming to harvest in the nations. Those who look not at God Politicians, what's the harvest here in, uh, in Ireland? A left-wing country in some ways where people learn, lean toward the left. And so there's massive demonstrations yesterday in Dublin for the last six weeks where thousands are marching with Palestinian uh, uh, flags it's amazing this is the harvest 
What's the harvest of technology in the lives of our young people who walk along the streets with their eyes glued to their cell phones, who know not how to really think deeply about anything? The harvest of what the enemy has sowed in the field. It's coming to harvest. What's the harvest of all the brilliance of men called the United Nations that tries to unite the nations who will not be united, who still seek their own ends? You see, what work does God work on the wheels? He works a work where in his patience he waits for it to be proven that man doesn't have what it takes that all his combined spill skills think of the little schoolgirl, you know who's nothing more than a pawn of great powers who's bleating forever about climate change the little swedish nothing let's look at things from the prophetic point of view let's understand what god is doing Let's understand. And yet growing in the midst of all this and continuing to grow will be his people. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. They shall not be overcome. They shall be harassed and they shall be much troubled. But they shall be there for at the end of time, he shall harvest a grey crop of his people. Faith may seem to fail with many. And so I, I go into, and in my mind, I think, but you understand, if you go down in the 13th of Matthew, here it is, Jesus' interpretation. It fascinates the apostles. They listen. Verse 36. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house. And his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. He answered and said to them, He that soweth good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. Isn't that lovely? You know, he's not talking about the good seed being the word. He's talking about the good seed being the children, the sons of the kingdom. Hallelujah. Children of the kingdom. I like that. You know, uh, am I a child of the kingdom? Last night I unexpectedly spoke at a small meeting in an area of Dublin. I just went along there and I wasn't expecting to speak. And, and I was asked on the spot, would you speak to us? And so I opened my mouth and began to speak. And I spoke on the kingdom of God, us being the children of the kingdom in the midst of a wicked world, not being the church. You know, I don't know whether you realize the days of church as we know it are coming to an end. Did you realize that? Church on Sunday morning. The bands, the preachments, the success orientation. My brethren, it's coming to an end. Church as we have known it. But what is not coming to the end is the true church, the sons of the kingdom. They shall gather in houses of whatever time they can. 
for the fruit is like the seed. You who live in the prairies or go out in Canada and drive through, you know that in the springtime the, the soil is black and turned and ready and then out goes that great thing planting the seed. And then 13 or 15 weeks later, it's six foot tall and there's that corn on the cob and you open up, you shuck that corn and there in that corn are identical seeds to what was sown multiplied a hundredfold at least. Am I right? And you know that the church in earliest days met in caves and catacombs. In simplicity, they gathered in love the wealthy landowner and his sl slaves, equalized entirely as they gathered unto the Lord. They broke bread gladly from house to house. They were harassed by the world. This was the seed sown, my brethren. This shall be the crop harvested. The church in its simplicity, without all the paraphernalia, hallelujah, the paraphernalia of worldliness that's gotten into the churches. And this is what is happening. It shall happen in Malaysia, my brethren. It shall happen in Borneo, Sarawak. It shall happen in England. It shall happen in the European. It shall happen in Canada. It shall happen in the United States. It shall happen as the, the sons of the wicked one. Do you get that there? The tears, verse 38. End of the verse, the tares are the children of the wicked one. As they take their place, as they come to the fullness of their attempts at grandeur, as they seek to cure the needs of the world, there, there, in their glories, they think, their glory that shall fade away, fading glory, fading glory, fading glory, but there in the midst of society shall be in the neighborhoods, the people of God, the little lights shining, the little lights shining into the houses shall come people in need and they, there shall be salvation in the earth. These are the things for which we must prepare ourselves and understand. Doesn't mean to say we jettison, I don't jettison, you know, going and speaking in large meetings and that sort of thing. But I know where everything's going. And I know that in every nation, there shall be sons of the kingdom gathering together loving the Lord. I know that in the time of his appointment, he shall come, the angels shall come, and the harvest shall be reaped, and precious shall be the day when he comes with great care and gathers. He doesn't gather the church into bunches, and burn them. He gathers each precious soul unique in his sight and takes them into his arms and loves them. Isn't it amazing when you reflect upon these things? I'm trying to paint a big picture. I'm trying to show us what God is doing, what he's doing on his wheels. What is he doing with me as an individual? Because I'm on his wheel. What is he doing with you in your countries? You know, <laughs> I, I, I switch over in my thinking and 
I want you to understand a little more about what's happening in the church. Go over into Philippians chapter 2 and look there. What's he doing? Uh, art thou weary? Art thou languid? <laughs> That's the words from a hymn. You know, have you got wearied with the with the noisy stuff going on in some churches with the constant repetitious move, music and so on and so forth. Do you yearn, my brethren, for this is what's happening. Do you yearn for heart fellowship with kindred hearts, young and old? I think of young ones who yearn for heart fellowship. There are some of them. You go into Philippians 2 and he says, if there be uh, therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit. Now that's church life in a nutshell. Look at it again. Encouragement in Christ. Incentive of love. Participation in the spirit. Affection and sympathy. Four things. That's real church life in a nutshell. Church life in four parts. First part, where Christ's the great encourager in the midst, speaking day by day by day by day by day. As you gather Christ in the midst, as you gather Christ speaking, not the song leader, not the pastor giving some topical sermon, but people gathered unto Christ and he's encouraging his saints. Don't you think you're going to need that in the face of all what the enemy does? Second thing is, is there any incentive of love? You know, when you hear the encouragements of Christ, you are in, you're quickened to love. You must love more. One of the marks that I have found that when I hear Christ, he tells me, he just not only tells me, he empowers me to, to love more, to love more. He says to me, Bernard, you haven't loved enough. I sat here with two men earlier this week. One of them is doing his master's in theology. And he came to discuss a, a paper that he is writing and uh, trying to find his way through it. He's a dear man who lives in his mind too much. And somehow the conversation came round to what we need, what the church really needs. And I said, I'll tell you what it needs, more of Christ that leads to love. See, these things that Paul mentions are in an order. Four things, get them clear. First thing, encouragement of Christ. When Christ is ministering in the midst of the church, when Christ is gathered unto, when you hear him, you know, in the small group or large, when you quit arguing about Palestine and Israel, the, the present argument that is dividing some churches, when you quit the squabblings, you know, about uh, Calvinism and Arminianism, when you quit and you just begin to hear Christ, you'll find that you are incentivized to love. There's an incentive to love, to love more. And as you love more, you will be participating in the spirit. That's the third thing. That's the third thing. 
you'll be participating in the spirit <laughs> and if you're participating more and more in the blessed spirit you will be made compassionate and a person of sympathy now that's going to be very different to the hardening processes that are going on among the nations you understand that in the last days the the line of demarcation between the sons of the kingdom and the sons of the wicked one is going to become so stark so stark that the communities of god's people will be so different they will have been losing their jobs because of their testimony they will have to be caring for one another Amen. They will be so different to those who are treading on one another, climbing the corporate ladder, abusing one another. Do you understand what I'm saying? They will be people of love and compassion in the midst of a world that's full of and increasing in its hate and wickedness. This is who we'll be. If you want to look at it a little a clearer statement, look at verse 14 of chapter 2, where it says, you won't be people who are grumbling and questioning. Isn't that the testimony of the world? Grumble, 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 grumble. Disputing, questioning, bickering, bickering, bickering. Do all things without grumbling or questioning. Stop fighting your circumstances that you may be blameless and harmless. Innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Yea, my brethren, America, crooked and perverse. Canada, crooked and perverse. Now, you know, Malaysia, crooked and perverse. Australia, crooked and perverse. England, Europe, crooked and perverse. And oh, the blessed people of God yielding to him in the midst of things hallelujah having hearts of compassion deep compassion and sympathy for each other and then in the midst of the world a, a story i read long ago in the works of tacitus tacitus was a roman historian who was not a christian and he's writing in the days of the church's persecution when all the stories were going around about the people of god uh, meeting in their houses in secret where stories were told that they were killing children and drinking their blood and that's the distortion of the idea that had come uh, in, and they were just having communion they were just breaking bread and drinking wine and Tacitus wrote about them it can't be right it can't be right these people are not killing babies they're not odd stupid people and the reason for that is that the plague has come through our city and the people when someone is sick in their house, they're throwing the, the people still alive out of the house, into the street. And the Christians, these people, are going and getting those that are their neighbours who've been thrown out in the street and they're taking them into the house and they're nursing them. And some of them are being raised up 
and some of them are dying. And some of those who took them into their house are dying. They're estranged people, these Christians, that they should do that. Where the people in the world are throwing the, the bodies out. I mean, last night, some of us men were together on a Zoom. And our brother Ken, who's, I think he's on today, yeah, I see him. And he was telling us of just about the throwaway society. That now in Canada, a mentally ill person can request euthanasia. Throwaway society. Let's throw away the babies, eh? Throw away the babies. Throw away. And we are the preserving society. We are the loving society. We are the different people. You know, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, I'm at the end of verse 15 in our chapter 2 of Philippians. Among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life in the midst of it all, the word that brings life to you, hold fast. This is why some of the Christians die, because they don't hold fast to the word of life. They, they hold fast, fast to some doctrine or other, some head assent to truths. And so it does not impart life to them, life that fortifies them and enables them to live in the midst of it all without grumbling and complaining, holding fast the word of life so that in the day of Christ, I may be proud that I did not run or labor in vain. I tell you, this is the prophetic word concerning what God will do in the church. The show will go on in some quarters, compromised. The church in its public face will be a compromised people. They shall still meet in their buildings, but the life of the Lord will not be there. There shall be, my brethren, oh, all the things that the world counts great shall be going on in the churches. There shall be in the buildings toilets for male and toilets for fail, female and toilets for whoever will. <laughs> Just a reflection. The compromised state. That's what will happen. But the real church shall be as the seed was that was sown those years ago. 2,000 of them. <laughs> you know, they shall shine as lights in the world. These are the things that will happen. They shall be the people. So I'm, I'm still here. They shall all have the same mind and the same love. Verse 2. They'll be in full accord of one mind. They'll be doing nothing from, from selfishness or conceit. They'll have this mind in them. Verse 5. Which you have. You know, I have this mind, you have this mind, you must let it work out in you into its fullness. This mind that was in Christ Jesus, this mind of the servant, this mind who went lower and lower, this mind that emptied himself, emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, this mind, you know, that he humbled himself, became obedient unto death. This is, this is the crop that God will reap. Hallelujah. Each one precious. God highly exalted him. Given him a name which is above every name. 
Hallelujah. And so I get to a climax now in this regard where I come here to. Therefore, my beloved, verse 12, as you've always obeyed, so now not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it's God who is at work in you. What's he working in me? This mind about which Paul has been writing? This mind of Christ, what's what's he working in you? Work out what God's working in you. Give yourself up to it. It's God who's at work in you. You're back to the same theme of what dost thou work in these days, Lord? What are you doing among the nations? I'm allowing them to grow together unto their harvest. I'm allowing their, their top technological brilliance to come to its harvest. I'm allowing all their expertises to try and cure everything. Oh, give us time. We'll harness the weather. There won't be any more typhoons. Just give us time. We'll know how to release things into the atmosphere when something's come. Just give us time. We can cure it all. God is allowing them to fail, to do it all and fail. Oh, just give us time. We'll harmonize mankind. We'll make them one. Just give us time. Just give us more time. We'll get rid, you know, we'll use all our skills medically to remove all those horrible things that make children Down syndrome. Just give us time. We don't need God. We are God. Just give us time. That's what God's doing in the world. Until it all comes to nothing. For in that day of final judgment, every mouth shall be stopped. No one shall say, but you didn't give us time. You didn't give us time to really have communism because we could have done it without you. God will say, I gave you time. Every mouth will be stopped. No one will be able to say. And the angels will witness all this and they will agree 100% God is God. Every lie about him is a lie. God will be entirely justified in all that he has ever done. And all the hints of untruth and all the whispers that filled the heavens, Jesus will have cleansed it all away. And God will be entirely justified in what he does then, where those who will not receive him and have not received him, he will put away far from him. Isn't it amazing? This is what God's doing. He's working a work in our day. You know that the wicked one spilled out a lie into heaven first. And a third of the angels embraced his lie. And the essence of the lie is God is not God. God doesn't know what he's doing. I am God. And that lie he fed in and God permitted him so to do. So that same lie in the garden. And allowed it to come to its full fruit. Are you getting the picture? It's a massive one. 
And then God displayed the hidden heart of his being in Calvary. That which I have loved, that which I have made, that which I have created, I have loved and I love it still. And I will love it unto death through my son. There is a verse, a line in a hymn that I do not agree with where someone said about uh, in the line in the hymn, the father turned his face away. Did he? Did he really? When his son perished on the tree as, as the son died for mankind, did, did the father turn his face away? Or was the father amazed and thrilled at the obedience of his son? As the son tore the veil away of the heart of the father in his love for all that he has made, that he would pay the ultimate Christ to, price to redeem through Christ. Glory to the name of the Lord. You think about it. This is our God who's working a work. He was working a work in those days. I see everything that happened in Calvary, everything that led up to it. I see the nations rising. I see the empire rising. And I see this weak lamb, strong, strong, going to Calvary. I see him bereft of friends, though ladies were around about him and the odd man, but the sheep were scattered and I see it and I see that, oh man, the career of our Lord Jesus is the career of his church. <laughs> And there it took place, and darkness seemed to reign. But really, my brethren, the light was glorious in the sun. Something was being birthed there. That was being a new creation was coming into being through that death and resurrection. And uh, I see that that took place there. Here we are. The career of the church is similar. Am I making sense? I'm saying many things for you to think about, to ponder, to realize God is working a work in your day. Isn't it a tremendous thing that for me to live to the glory of God is disproving every lie of Satan? Isn't that a wonderful thing? Isn't that a wonderful thing? And so, what is God working in our day in the church? The end of all the flashy stuff. Bringing us back to the essence of what church is captivated in those, or captured in those four phrases that chapter two begins with. place where Christ is gathered unto. Are there five of you that gather? Are you ready to be this simple? Am I ready to be this simple? I know that some of you I've spoken to you. I know that you're so loyal. But are you gathering in simplicity unto him in the midweek where the consolation of Christ is coming to your hearts and you encourage one another. There's comfort of love that is increasing among you so that you know that you're loving more in these latter days than you did in the former. Are you coming through to this great fellowship of the Spirit? Hallelujah! I tell you, my brethren, the church is fellowshipping with the world in so much of its practices and its ways. 
It's squabbling. It's arguing. It's getting hooked. It watches the news too much. It gets incited into side taking. You understand? We we are, you know, instead of for the fellowship of the spirit, fellowship with the world dressed up in Christian garments. And so these are things that God is doing. Sifting, sifting, sifting. Do we not see that the world in different ways has eclipsed Christ? This phrase, and I'm drawing to an end now. I meant to begin with this. But you know, there's a phrase, the eclipse of Christ. That's the thing that's happened. You know, everything the devil does, the whole aim is to eclipse Christ. You know what, if you've ever seen an eclipse, there's that brightness of the sun still shining through, you know, even when the moon is coming across 50%, still the, the, the brightness is shining. And then comes that moment where the moon completely eclipses the brightness of the sun and everything goes dark. Such was the day of Calvary. Amazing, my brethren. And I know that the devil comes in the churches and I know that part of this argumentation about, 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 about Palestine and Israel and that's current at the moment in some people's minds, it's eclipsing Christ who's working a work in our day. In others, <clears throat> it can be arguing about Calvin and Arminius and the sovereignty of God and the free will of men so that people are arguing about these things and they're eclipsing Christ. It's happened to me. I had to repent. I think of a very dear man who I knew very, very well, who became a specialist in eschatology, the doctrine of the end times. He was a missionary in Nigeria for a while. His children and his wife was not happy with it. And there was difficulties in their life and he became an expert and he was part of a church that we were in. And he would teach on eschatology, the interpretation of the book of the Revelation. He got fascinated with it. And, you know, he, he said to me, well, he went off to a Bible college in the United States in upper New York State, taught their eschatology, and then he came back to England. And he lived in a place uh, not far from us, and I would go and see him. And not long before he died, he said to me, Bernard, you have seen me in meetings as an old man. Even when you have preached, Bernard, I've come forward and I've knelt on my knee knees. And I've just done it again and again. When others have preached, I've done the same. Uh, do you know why I did it? Why I came forward as an old, old man, could hardly get down on my knees, let alone get up. He said, because I looked back and I allowed the doctrine of the last things to so fascinate me. <laughs> blotted out Jesus from my life. <laughs> life with Jesus. And so I come forward time and again just to say to Jesus, you're the center now. You're my life. You bring me to the Father. That's what he said to me. I regret 
I spent so many hours and hours and hours and hours devouring the books. What, of course, in those days, he couldn't have watched YouTube. It didn't exist. And Sarah Christ. You see the eclipse of Christ. I find myself sitting more and more quiet in his presence. I realize that he is the savior of the world. I realize that bombs and this and that and the others, they're all coming to naught. Everything's coming to naught. And when you think what God is doing, here in Ireland, I'll finish with this. Bibi was there, I think. Yes, I'm sure she was. <laughs> Just before <laughs> COVID came, I'd been down for four nights in Australia. And I came back up and, and on the weekend, I think it was Friday, Saturday, Sunday, I spoke at a church, it's dim in my memory, but dear friends in claim and Assemblies of God Church, and I know B.B. was there. And the pastor had said to me, Bernard, we're installing some elders, will you help us? And I said, yes. Sunday morning, he, he said, okay, we're standing out the front, the elders, the pastor, those who are going to be installed into eldership, <clears throat> recognized. And we're standing there and suddenly into my heart came this very, very clear prophetic word. Well, it was a vision at first. And it was of a very swiftly flowing stream, river. It's a river, not a stream. It was a river. It wasn't very, very deep, but it was very, very clear. And into this stream, this river, stepped a giant prospector. Very large. And he had a great big pan and he dipped the pan into the, the swiftly flowing stream. And he lifted it out and he bore it on his left arm like this. And... Uh, it was filled and he swept these stones away off the top of it straight away with his right arm. And then he dipped it back in and employing the swiftly flowing current and his own movements, he gradually swished and away the debris, the mud, the silt, and he persisted in doing it until he had obtained his gold. The gold that had been laying there down in the bottom and down silted over with mud and rocks, been there all the time. And then the, the word of the Lord came. We were all standing there, or I was standing there. And then the prophetic word came. You are not to fear what is to come. This is four days before the first lockdown in England. I flew home that night. This is four days before the, the, the first lockdown. You are not to be afraid of what is shortly to come upon the world in the swift flowing current of my of circumstances i am working and i am standing in the midst of it and i am not moved by the swiftness of the current i stand strong and i'm doing my work for the church and i am panning for my gold and I will work and I will remove things. And I will continue to work and I will employ. And do not be afraid that things are murky where my pan goes in the water. Because it is a necessity that there is a murkiness in the water as the mud and the silt and the stones are lifted up. It is a disturbing time, 
but I'm doing my work and I will find my gold. And this came back to us very clearly earlier this week, last week, I mean, where a group of men were together and this came back and the Lord added something. Some people, how did the gold get there? They were blessed in years gone by and they were carried by the stream of the of the of the the blessing of God like a river that carried them far from where they had been. And then the river slowed. The river slowed. The pace slowed. It slowed and the gold sank to the bottom. Another stuff settled upon them, and there the gold piece, the gold little nuggets lay there, fast bound in a kind of darkness. But I know where my gold is, and I will come, and I will exhume them from where they've allowed their lives to settle. I think it's a word that's rather relevant to some people in England. Where they were carried into great blessing 30 years ago, 40 years ago, and, and then the pace of life slackened and the blessings slackened and they sank to the bottom of the stream and the concerns of this world overlaid them like silt and small stones and larger rocks. And then the Lord comes to... <laughs> what dost thou work in our day, Lord? Amen. I'm doing that too in my church. I'm bringing my gold up. <laughs> I'm exhuming them from their <laughs> amen. And I'm, I'm, I'm treasuring my gold. So there you are, my brethren. I've covered quite a lot of ground. I hope it's helpful. Something to reflect upon. His love for his people, his love for the nations, his love for his church, his love for the people. Uh, Lord, carry on your work. <laughs> Help us to be utterly, utterly, I don't like to say in sync with you, but you will know what I mean. It's not out of synchronization, dear. So that our prayers <laughs> will get further than in the ceiling. I said to someone <laughs> earlier this week, you know, just now you're beginning to pray the real prayer, not out of frustration, not out of argument, not out of disappointment, not out of disillusionment. When you've been praying from that basis, your prayers never got higher than the ceiling. But now you're praying out of love and concern and humility and your prayers are reaching to the throne. Mm. Amen. Amen. So there we are, my brothers and sisters. Amen. Amen. I reckon that's quite, quite enough. Amen. Thank you, baby. Thank, Thank you. you. Would you like to lead us in prayer? Mm. Yes, I will. I will. I'll be <laughs> happy to do that. Happy to just bring us all to the Lord. Thank you for the opportunity, Father, to just, well, sometimes it's like sharing. I know that your people, not just ourselves, we need prophetic insight. We need a sight oh. of, of, of what you're doing in many levels. I work a work in your day. 
That's what you say to us. You're not to be afraid. I'm working my work. Hallelujah. And our hearts are stilled in your presence. For you are God. You're not a, a man that you should lie. You are the great God. You are God in, in Mary, God in Kuching, God in East Malaysia, God in Peninsula Malaysia. Same God in Singapore, Australia. You are God in Canada, God in the United States. God in England, God here in Ireland. Details vary, principles never. Principles never, the principles of your ways. Hallelujah. We think, Lord, of you, our dear Lord, suffering on the tree and the nations gathered round about embodied in the rage of religion in the rage of Rome the empire of the day and you the king upon the throne truth upon the scaffold but you were most glorious commanding everything, expiring at the moment of your choice. They didn't kill you, Lord. You overcame in your life, and then you gave yourself up to your Father. Into your hands I commit my spirit. You gave up your spirit. And you laid your head down, gave yourself to your father, trusting utterly in the resurrection, knowing that he is faithful to finish his work and raise you from the dead and set you at the right hand, at his right hand. And so it happened. Amen. And so with us, Lord, <clears throat> help us to trust to die that we might live, to love more. Oh, Lord, mm -hmm. we're not going to try to make these things happen, but to agree with you as they occur, Lord, so that we are really in absolute harmony with what you're doing not a clog in the way but people who are right in harmony so that we have faith because we are dwelling in love and the hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shred abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost who is given unto us Oh. We pray for one another. Pray for Malaysia yes. now. Yes. East and West, each in their different places. Yes. Lord, in their different set of circumstances. Yes. Lord, in these days when the dragon stands in front and tries to devour and threatens to devour, May your church bring forth the man-child in these days in Malaysia mm. and Africa and even here mm. in Ireland. May the man-child be brought forth, the man-child. Mm. Not babies, but make us men, mm. real men. In God, ladies who are truly mature in you and men who are mature in you, 
these things you work in our day. And we say yes to you. In Jesus' name, amen.